Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich Gurman. Oceana is the largest international conservation organization dedicated to protecting the ocean. Under the leadership of Anne-Lee Sharpless, Oceana, along with its powerful board, world-class ambassadors, and its allies, have protected nearly 4 million square miles of ocean and won over 250 significant policy victories that will protect and restore it. Their campaigns include banning bottom trawling and offshore drilling in Belize, protecting the second largest barrier reef system in the world. In 2016, Oceana also launched Global Fishing Watch in collaboration with Google and SkyTruth, where they're tracking the fishing practices of commercial fishing vessels all across the ocean. Andy, welcome to the show. It's an honor, man. How are you? Nice to see you, Rich. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. Always good to be with you. So I want to start with something very timely. Just last week, the U.S. Senate passed the Shark Fin Elimination Act, essentially banning the trade of shark fins in the U.S. This milestone comes after tireless campaigning by Oceana and your allies. Last week, I also interviewed on this show shark girl Madison Stewart, whose entire life is committed to protecting sharks. So I want to begin here. Tell me about this big win. Yeah, this is it's nice to start with good news, isn't it, Rich? Um <laughs> Yes. So everybody who is listening and watching will probably know, but let's remind them that um, sharks are badly depleted all over the world. Set, people estimate that 73 million sharks a year are killed chiefly for their fins. Why is that? Well, the fins are exported to China mostly for use in a kind of fancy gourmet meal shark fin soup. The problem with that is that sharks reproduce very, very slowly. You know, they give birth to, they don't lay eggs. They give birth to little baby sharks, like baby like sharks. Pets or like we do <laughs> as yeah. human beings. And so, and they also live a long time. Many of the species do. So very sadly, they, they, they're just not biologically able to be fished as hard as they're being fished. And survive. I mean, there are there many species are down in single digit percentages of what they were even in the 1970s. So it's a serious problem, and it's being driven by the demand for fin soup. So it's a little bit to us. It reminds us a lot of the situation with the ivory trade and elephants. And um, everybody will remember that you know elephants were being killed for their tusks. And you would have these horrible pictures of beautiful animals in the African just lying there with their tusks cut off. And the same thing's happening to fins, the sharks, where they're, they're caught sometimes alive, had their fins cut off, they're discarded sometimes at sea, still alive. It's a cruel practice. Anyway, we think that this, the lesson that we learned about elephants is, applies to sharks. We've got to ban the trade worldwide. It's not a sustainable trade. It's not a sustainable practice. These are very vulnerable creatures. They reproduce slowly. So the action that the Senate has taken is really path-breaking, and we need the House to follow suit and the President to sign this into law. The House has previously passed this, this bill, so unless something really dramatic has happened, we would expect the House to follow suit um, and pass this sometime in this Congress, we hope well before the end of it, and that we expect the president will sign it. This will send a very, very dramatic message to the world, um, and we need other countries to follow suit, but the Americans get to lead on this. The Canadians have already taken um, action, a similar action. They, they've forbidden the import and export of fins. They get credit for really being a good leadership country in that way. But w the Americans are doing that, and they're also banning, if this passes into law, the, in, the domestic trade. So if you caught a shark in American waters and you landed it, you wouldn't be able to sell the fin. You still sell the shark, but you can't sell the fin. So I, I, I'm glad to start with that. It's very important. Yeah. You know, it's, it was a very encouraging week for me. You know, we all have ups and downs in the conservation battles. And, uh, and, and I was really lifted by this news out of the United States Senate. And I hope that your listeners will. I mean, there's an opportunity for action here. If you're an American and you're listening, paying attention to this, you ought to write to your congressperson 
and encourage them to support the House, you know, the House side version of this bill. Yes. I guess my question is, and, and we're all for wins. We, we need wins, no doubt about it. Um, obviously, there's not a huge market for shark fin soup in the United States, as you mentioned, the bigger issues in China. How do you see the U.S. stepping up? You mentioned Canada. Uh, hopefully Europe would do the same. How, how are all of us working, banding together? How can we make an impact in China where, as you say, the real issue is? Well, I, I think you just described it. I mean, you, the end game is going to be the Chinese deciding to do for, to protect the sharks from the fin trade the way they decided to protect the elephants from the ivory trade. They did do that. So we have that encouraging example that the Chinese can eventually get to that place. Uh, I think that they need to get, you know, they, they need to get the message from the rest of the world that people care about this uh, and want this outcome. And so you're right. I mean, I think the next step will be to have some Latin American countries come forward and do the same thing and to have Europeans come forward and do the same thing, some African and Asian countries to follow suit. And um, sooner the, the sooner the Chinese take the action, the better. That will be the definitive event in, it's the, such a in the life of the sharks when the Chinese come around. And there's, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an optimist. I mean, I think the elephant trade gives us an example. The elephant ivory trade gives us an example of why optimism isn't just, you know, is, is, is believable here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. It's just, it's so ingrained in their society, right? The, the eating of the soup, it's um, a sign of prosperity. So we're definitely up against a lot of their heritage and just their culture. So, but hopefully they can wake up to the fact that it's yeah, I mean, not only cruel to the sharks, but it's it's critical to the whole ecosystem of yeah. the ocean. I mean, there are you're, you're right. I mean, in all with all due respect, I mean, we all have our own cultural practices. Every culture does, and you know, who are we to to judge as outsiders? You know, another person's culture, except if we have a common ground, which is science. And you know, when when science tells you that you have a cultural practice that is really damaging the world, I think all of us have a duty to reevaluate cultural practices that, that run straight head, you know, forward into a scientific proof that they're cataclysmic. This is one of those. And I think a science, we do have, you know, that it's, it's notable the uh, Chinese government several years ago forbid the serving of, of shark fin soup at, at, at uh, government events. Mm. So, it, you know, they have already, you know, accepted to some extent that the practice needed some, some regulations, some dialing back. Um, it's it's permitted, you know, that that limit was um, a signal, I thought, at the time mm -hmm. that they were, you know, they were alert to the issue and, and ready to take more steps. So they haven't subsequently taken more steps, but at least shows the doors cracked open. Very good. And I don't mean to diminish the win. It's just to really make a difference yeah. for the sharks. We got to take it to the well, next level. I mean, it's, you're being practical and you're right to be practical and um, we, at the end of the day, that'll be the test. Uh, we got to get, we, to, if we're going to save the sharks and we need to do that. I mean, the other thing about the sharks, I just want to mention Rich and they're an, they, you know, what the, you know, ecologists call an apex predator, which means that they're the consequences of taking them out of the ocean in, in, in a systematic and, you know, nearly complete way are very, they cascade from the top of the ecosystem all the way down through in ways that can be very destabilizing to the whole ocean ecosystem and almost impossible to predict. I mean, you just, you, you don't, you know, what, and to oversimplify a little bit, you get, what you will get is a boom of the thing that the sharks eat. And That's the right. things that that, and since shark are at the top, the things that sharks eat, if they, if they multiply by 10, 20, 100 fold, then whatever they eat will be in big trouble. <laughs> and uh, in fact, there's a story, not a story, a study uh, about uh, of the scallop fishery off of New North Carolina, where there was a collapse in a very long standing, hundred year, multi hundred year long, wonderful fishery there. That when the scientists analyzed the cause, uh, they decided that what was clobbering the scallops was the uh, a boom in in rays that eat the scallops and what had been eating the rays sharks and what had, mm. what had happened to the sharks is they had been overfished and they were down as i said at duke had discovered they were many big sharks were down at two three four seven percent of what they were in the 1970s yeah and i want to say anyone, 
Anyone that wants to go way deeper in this conversation of the importance of sharks, make sure you listen to one of my most recent episodes with, with Madison Shark Girl. Because I'm happy she, to be a flack for Madison. She's great. <laughs> she's, she's awesome. Um, yeah, it was a really fun conversation, too, and she really understands the issue. And a lot of it was we've been trained. Sharks are bad. They're, they're a killer. And so it's okay to just kill them. And what we don't understand, I think people, it's starting to become more mainstream, um, is that we, like you're saying, Andy, we absolutely need them for a healthy ocean ecosystem. Speaking of that, let's move to um, another topic that is not only a major focus of yours, but also one that is receiving a lot of attention lately with the masses, mostly due to the Netflix documentary Seaspiracy, and that is overfishing and bycatch. Uh, it seems counterintuitive that to save the ocean, we should promote eating fish. Many would say we should stop eating fish altogether or at least create a moratorium to give the ocean time to heal, uh, which, as we know, that happens very quickly in the ocean. Yet that is not very real realistic as well over one billion people rely on fish as a main food source. So I'm curious, what is Oceana's stance on the consumption of fish as it relates to protecting the world's most vital resource, the ocean? Yeah, you know, people have a right to choose what they eat, and veganism is a uh, is a diet choice that some some of us can make. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a choice that you know hundreds of millions of people in the world have option have open to them. There, as you just said, there are you know hundreds and hundreds of millions of people, many of them in poor countries, whose survival depends upon being able to eat some fish and. Um, they just don't have the option. So, um, and in fact, there's even evidence that the nutritional benefits that the micronutrients and vitamins that are in fish bring to some hundreds of millions of people are essential to whether your baby develops a healthy brain and is, you know, stunted or not, you know, for the rest of their life. So lots of people need need to have fish available to them. It's just not realistic to force veganism on them. So, um, and you know, the other estimate is that there's 3 billion people in the world who, who get at least 20% of their animal protein from, from seafood. So this is a big part of the human diet and, uh, and we, we need it to be abundant, <laughs> the ocean to be abundant to feed all those people and also to feed the creatures in the ocean that thrive in an abundant ocean. So that's what we do. Save the oceans to, to help feed the world. That's our mission. Uh, you know, at a time when global hunger is on the rise, in part because of COVID and climate change and, you know, various conflicts in the world, it's just not a time to walk away from this is, you know, this really wonderful resource for people. So that's what we do. And, um, you know, the film does a very good job of documenting some of the problems that overfishing brings to the world. It doesn't do a good job of describing what the solutions are. Um, you know, there there is a thing there is a thing called sustainable fishing. The film's point of view is that that doesn't exist and that's just false. Um, it's true both in theory and in practice that there is sustainable fishing. There are plenty of examples where it fails, and that's I'm not trying to whitewash this, the picture. Oceana and other organizations are fighting to fix the broken countries, but. Uh, in, in academic literature, there's a concept called maximum sustainable yield, which is the academic definition of what sustainable fishing is. And then in practice, there are uh, countries that are doing a good job at setting and enforcing scientific quotas and protecting key nursery habitats and reducing bycatch and getting more fish in the ocean as a result. And there, in fact, there was a big academic study recently of some 288 fisheries around the world that showed plenty of examples of success of rebuilding so, I, I, I mean, your audience should be in, encouraged in a way that the film doesn't allow for because the film is wrong on this fact. <laughs> Sustainable fishing can, it does exist and it can be delivered by a competent government that does science-based ocean management. That was that was one of my next questions. Does sustainable fishing even exist? And I, I want to come right back to that. Let's talk about the movie just a little bit more. Obviously, it's created a lot of buzz and also controversy, I think mainly for some questionable stats represented, plus for their interviewing and editing uh, antics. 
calling out a few reputable groups in the nonprofit world. And obviously the movie tells the story of a filmmaker's personal journey, and they had every right to make the film. But perhaps it could have made a bigger impact if they chose to form an alliance with the organizations who've been working so long to protect the ocean instead of their shock and awe approach. So I'm, I'm curious what you felt just about that part. Yeah, I mean, it, it was disappointing to have a film that documented the problem quite powerfully, then conclude that it's instead of attacking the industrial overfishers and the polluters and the illegal activities of criminals on the ocean, they needed to attack the big conservation groups that are actually fighting the, the real problem and winning the victories that stop overfishing and protect habitat and reduce illegal activity. That was that was a you know that was disappointing to put it mildly, on on behalf of those of us who were who were doing that, um, you know we have we have uh, we can speculate about why you have to do that. There's an interesting piece by Daniel Pauly in Vox that I think people should go read if you're interested in sea spiracy. He's a he's an extremely distinguished marine biologist. He's actually the most quoted marine biologist in academic literature in the, in the world. Uh, he also serves on Oceana's board. He's a, he's a professor at the university of British Columbia, Vancouver. And he wrote a piece for Vox about sea spiracy that I really think people should read. Mm. Makes, makes a lot of excellent points that will be deeper than you and I will have time to go through here today. But, um, I mean, one of the things you, you know, if your, if your conclusion is, that you know the world should become vegan as the film recommended then i guess it's somehow the filmmakers had to feel like they had to knock down all the other alternatives which include things like well how about we manage the oceans well as we've proven we can do in some countries and make them make the make the oceans abundant and and mm -hmm. thrive again I, you know that's i guess that's how you know you have if you're really presenting something it seems pretty extreme, you have to knock down the alternatives to help people, convince people to get to your extreme outcome. Yeah, I hear you. And we'll, I'll, I'll get that link from you to that article we can share. Because, I, you know, for me, yeah, perfect world. Everyone would be vegan. I've been 90% plant-based for the last 15, 16 years, but we don't live in a perfect world. And I, I like looking at both sides. I, I don't want to say this is the way it's got to be. And, you know, and I, I think we need to be inclusive to everybody and work together to really solve the problems that we're facing as, as a planet and as a species. Um, so leading into sustainable fishing, because I'm actually really curious, does it actually exist? I, I want to first look at what Oceana is doing to monitor and manage global fishing practices. So first, can you lay out what the problem is, and then we can move into effective fisheries management. So um, science has shown that... Um, Fisheries are in decline on a global basis. And if you wanted to put one word on it, you would say it was overfishing. If you wanted to put three words on it, you would say, well, it's overfishing. It's destruction of core habitat, nursery habitat. And it's bycatch. The last one of those may be a little bit um, confusing to people. What is bycatch? Just bycatch is the is the killing of non-target species in your net. So you drag a net through the water, you catch not only what you're targeting, but other things that you're not targeting, and you probably kill a lot of that, those creatures sure. as well. So that's bycatch. So the solution, the way you rebuild ocean abundance, and this has been proven, is that you um, manage those three things through regulations that are enforced. So you set and enforce catch limits called quotas, you protect nursery habitat by creating marine protected areas, parks, gear limitations, and then you, you limit bycatch. You count the bycatch and you put strict limits on it. And when the bycatch reaches certain le levels, you stop fishing or you change your gear. All those things are proven methods in well-managed oceans do that. Now, a really important thing that Oceana figured out about 10 or 12 years ago that most people still do not know is that we can save the oceans country by country. You don't have to go to some kind of international conference run by the United Nations where the, where the, pro, where the process will be discouraging. You know, we know from sad experience mm -hmm. where these international debates seem like they go on forever 
everybody talks, 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 and the outcome is weak, and then nobody enforces it. Here's the, the, the wonderful thing about ocean conservation. We look to see where are most where do most of the fish live and where are they most of the fish caught, and it turns out they live and are caught in coastal parts of the oceans. And the coastal parts of the oceans have, for almost 40 years, been under the exclusive control of the adjacent coastal country under international law. So there's an international law called the Law of the Sea. It's been in place since the 1980s. And under that law, the United States is the exclusive manager of its ocean. The Canadians manage their ocean. The Japanese manage their ocean. The Chinese manage their ocean, on and on and on for all coastal countries in the world. And 90% plus of all of the world's oceans fish are in the coastal zones of 29 countries and the European Union. And more than about two thirds are in the, in the coastal zones of nine countries in the European Union. Let's let's say that again. That, that's a profound step. Yeah. So ninety percent of all the fish caught are in twenty nine countries and the European Union. And so that's thirty places. The European Union twenty nine countries. Okay. Now let me just pause on that. The European right. Union manages its catch as though it were one country. So when they created the European Union, they put the fishery management responsibility in Brussels. So it's fair to count for purposes of fisheries, oh, yeah. fisheries, it's okay. fair to count the European Union as one country. So 30 countries, counting the European Union as a country, mm -hmm. have 90 plus percent of the world's fish catch as, you know, as shown in the official data of the United Nations every year. So and two those, thirds yeah. are in nine countries, nine countries plus the European Union or 10, 10, 10. Countries it seems overwhelming to try to monitor, let alone manage the fishing practices of an entire planet but if we just focus on right. a handful you're getting the majority exactly so you so we at oceana have treated that list of 30 places 30 countries as the core universe of where our work needs to get done if we can if we can get these 90 these 30 countries counting the european mm -hmm. union as a country mm -hmm. to do what we just talked about set and enforce scientific quotas protect key habitat reduce bycatch you know what? The oceans will be abundant and healthy. And and that's so invigorating and exciting because it's it be, you know it becomes a doable thing. Now, as practical people, we look at that list very carefully all the time, and we have to make hard-nosed judgments about which countries on that list have the rule of law, which are under, you know, which can be trusted to to implement or, or not. And it's not every single one. But it's it's a lot of them, and um, it's enough to really give you confidence that you can make a big difference to the future. Now, the one thing that you know, one thing that does bear calling out, and we started talking about sharks, the creatures that that are most vulnerable to being depleted or destroyed or made to go extinct are therefore the creatures that. Um, live a part of their life out beyond the economic zone of a single country. They go out into what the technical term is, the, the high seas. They go out into the international zone of the oceans, which you could think of as the donut hole in the middle of the mm -hmm. oceans, sometimes a big donut hole, you know, that's inside the central part of the, it's the central part of the ocean where the peripheral parts are national and the central part is international. And those international parts are subject to all the problems that international management is sadly has. So they're run by yeah. committees. Catch the catch limits in those places are run by committees of government, you know, represented by committees of governments, basically, and they tend to do a pretty bad job. At, at ocean. So the high seas is it's kind of the wild, wild west. Yes. Is what you're saying. Yep. Okay. Got it. But, this is but don't be and, and it's a, and you know we worry about that and we you know, but that's you don't have to be. And it's. And it's easy to be discouraged by what you see out there, but don't extend that discouragement to the rest of the project. The rest of the project is easier. Makes sense. Okay, so let's back up just a little bit. From a philosophical standpoint, because um, I got to imagine your life got a little more challenging with the success of Sea Spiracy, which even the filmmakers admit they didn't, They, I, I heard them say they expected their movie to live in the hidden dark corner of Netflix. They didn't expect it to create the amount of awareness that it did. But from a philosophical standpoint, 
your organization is, yes, we want to save and protect the ocean. And at the same time, we need to consider the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people that rely on fish. And it's really dealing with both of those at the same time while minimizing the amount of bycatch and, and, and illegal shit that's happening out in the ocean. Is that, yeah, is that a pretty fair statement? Yes. Okay. So then let's talk about sustainable fishing. As I said earlier, uh, many people say that it does not exist. You talk about effective fisheries management. Is this the same as sustainable fishing to you? And you talked about overfishing, minimizing bycatch, and protecting habitat. So habitat. So just tell us more. for Because there's definitely people, I would imagine, listening, saying, and maybe even almost turning a blind ear towards you because they're, they're just – told over and over there is no such thing as sustainable fishing so i'm asking out of curiosity because i don't even know for sure what is what does sustainable fishing mean yeah there is there is a thing <laughs> there is a thing that can re, it can be called sustainable fishing and uh in academic literature uh you know the, the, there's a there's a there's a theoretical framework for for setting catch limits that's called maximum sustainable yield that has that is taught in leading academic institutions all over the world and is implemented around the world and is a key step toward managing your ocean so that it's abundant and sustainably abundant mm -hmm. while allowing for, for, for fishing. There also are success stories on the ground, in the water. I shouldn't say on the ground, in the water. <laughs> uh, and, and where fisheries have been rebuilt and commercial fishing has been sustained at a high level of catch and productivity and abundance. And uh, they exist. I mentioned an article in Nature uh, just recently, an academic article not done by NGOs, an academic article done by professors that studied actual fisheries, 288 of them, all over the world, north, south, east, west, and has countless examples with the data showing rebuilding occurring and okay. fishing continuing while there are still high levels of abundance. People should go read the article. There are also... Um, Countless examples, you know, within Oceania countries and in allies around the world of rebuilding success stories. There are also failures. So, I mean, I, there are countries that are doing a very bad job and there are fisheries that are depleted and there are serious problems. Uh, the fact that there are problems is not arguable. The fact that there are success stories is also not arguable. So, okay. you know, be able to see both sides of that and see the world as it is and not just have an ideological view that because there's been a bad failure in some places that cannot be success other places or vice versa. And, and I, uh, and I really, I really want people to understand that because it's, you know, it's, it's actually an area of conservation compared to terrestrial conservation. We've had a ocean conservation is kind of exciting to work on because when you get, when you give the fish a little bit of help, when you give them a little bit of sensible attention, scientific management, quotas, habitat, bycatch, uh, they will usually, it depends on the biology of the particular creature, but they will very often respond pretty quickly. And you can see in the data, depends on the species, sometimes mm -hmm. five or 10 year recoveries that are quite, they're almost, you know, breathtaking. And, you know, you, oh, if, you, wow. if you cut down your rainforest, you're going to be waiting centuries to see it come back. If you, if you ruin your fishery, which many people have done, it depends on the species. It depends on you know, other, some details. But there are plenty of success stories of fish coming back within a 5 or 10 or even 15-year period to very high yeah. levels of sustainable abundance. Which is a cause for optimism because, to, as we've seen, the ocean can recover extremely quickly, especially when it's left um, on its own. That's why I, I kind of like the idea of moratoriums where there's just low stocks of whatever fish yeah. it might be. This is a practice that's happened for centuries where they just won't touch that species. You know, when I, when I look at challenges and solutions, I look at what is the biggest lever that can be pulled to create the most impact. And as we're saying, it seems like that instead of trying to change people's personal behaviors, that Oceana's focus is on policy change. Is that correct? And what is being done in the three main areas that you mentioned, quotas, bycatch, and habitat? Yeah, so exactly. We, I mean, we honor the people who've made individual choices that help reduce their footprint on the, on the planet and on nature. Uh, we honor that. But the way that we're going to be, you know, actually be able to save big systems like the world's oceans is, is going to require collective action 
in the form of laws and implementation of those laws in the key c- countries that we just talked about, these 30 key countries around the world. That's what we need if we're going to save and rebuild an abundant ocean. So that's what we focus on delivering. National, typically, we're, our, we have teams of people in 10 countries now, citizens of those countries in every single case, going to their policymakers in their in their national capitals and making the case for these very simple things. Let's have a law that mandates scientific quotas, protects key habitat, reduces bycatch. Let's have a law that requires rebuilding of depleted fisheries. And let's get it done at the national level and let's implement it. And by the way, this is, you know, this is an argument that's good for everybody. It's not what it's not like it's not sad. It's, you know, climate change is harder to deal with because very often you're going to a country and saying, we need you, country X, to make some sacrifices in service of everybody on the planet. You know, when you rebuild ocean abundance in your own ocean, it's your it's your people that right, you know, that get to catch those fish and get to sell those fish or eat those fish. And, you know, so your own abundance is chiefly going to reward your own people. So we think this is a good a good policy for countries to have, and that's what we fight for. And um, it really comes down, I mean, I, it, it's not hard to understand. Uh, there, you know, the, the, if, you, if you have an abundant ocean, then every year when the, fi- the fish reproduce enough that you can catch some of those fish and then have the fish that you caught be, be replaced by new fish that were... Uh, that were more into the, the fish that were still in the ocean. And that kind of regenerative capacity can be managed so that it runs very, very well for, for you know, essentially in theory, forever and ever. Um, we estimate that a globally managed ocean where every country, all these 30 countries that did would do a good job that I mentioned, could mm-hmm. feed 1 billion people a seafood meal every single day Forever, which is um, which is a measure of the power of this resource for the for the for humanity and for the future. And by the way, for that to be happening, the oceans would have to be abundant. So if you just if you love the creatures in the ocean, there would be a lot of them. Why is um, fish farming not a solution? Yeah, this is a great question, and it's very counterintuitive, isn't it, Rich? It seems like it should be a solution. If you're farming fish, then you must be helping reduce the pressure on the wild fishery. That seems like what must be happening. Turns out that's not the case at all. There are three kinds of of, of fish farming, and and in, in, and you need to know based on what the farmer is feeding their fish. Okay, so turns out that in many of the farm fish that people eat are farmed by somebody who's actually feeding those fish other fish. A lot of it, right? Yeah. So, for example, salmon, which is a commonly farmed fish, is a carnivore. Right. So I think salmon is, is a little cat or a big cat. A <laughs> big salmon is. And so salmon farmers have salmon cooped up in big pens in the, in, in the ocean in order to make them grow. They're feeding them marine fish that have been caught and ground up and made into little pellets that are kind of like dog food, but for salmon. And in the process, they're, they're, they're basically reducing the amount of fish that people could eat because it takes, estimates vary, but it takes three or four pounds of wild caught fish to produce one pound of farmed salmon. So in effect, you're taking often you're taking small, very healthy fish, sardines, anchovies, that people could eat, uh, grinding them up and then and turning them into salmon, having therefore reduced the amount of animal protein that people have to eat. And then you're very often then fa- flying that salmon from a poorer country mm-hmm. to a richer country. <laughs> so in effect, what you, you also have equity impacts. Um, and then, of course, the... The dense farming of salmon has a lot of the same problems that people are familiar with from feedlock farming of livestock on the land. There's easy transmission of disease within the pens, so they end up the farmers end up applying a lot of pesticides. 
and they have uh, viral problems. They also, the fecal matter from the fish tends to accumulate underneath the pens and to contaminate the, the fjords where they, where they are operating. So that is a very troublesome business that it's, it's hard to understand why that's good for the world. Um, so I encourage people to eat wild salmon, you know, healthy, abundant wild salmon is the thing to do. Find, find an abundant salmon fishery, buy your fish from them. Don't eat farm salmon. Now at the other end mm -hmm. are, um, of, farm, of fish farming uh, is a quite good thing. And that's the farming of um, shellfish, clams, mussels, oysters. And these farmers are doing us all a wonderful favor because they're um, creating healthy you know, marine protein out of a, out of basically out of algae. <laughs> you know, these are filter feeders. They don't eat other fish. They filter the water and they convert basically algae in the water into little, little animals that we're happy to eat. And um, by the way, they, these farmers are always allies for us conservationists in battles against ocean polluters because you can't be a oyster farmer in a polluted bay. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be wonderful allies in the battle to have clean ocean bays and rivers, you know, estuaries. So, so we like that. And I want to, you know, if you're interested in eating farm farmed uh, seafood, you should go ahead and order all the clams and oysters and mussels to your heart's content and mussels to your heart's <laughs> content and feel very virtuous. In the middle, between those two, the bad and the good of mm -hmm. fish farming, are farmed animals, that uh, fish that eat grain. Tilapia is an example of that. Um, and in essence, what you're doing there from a biological or an ecological perspective is you're kind of like eating a chicken that was farmed underwater. You know, you're you're eating something that did require a field, a grain field somewhere to support the activity of the farmer. That grain field could easily have been a converted forest and therefore to be implicated in biodiversity loss on the land. Um, your audience should know that the biggest driver of biodiversity loss on the land big ag. is agriculture. So big yeah. fields of corn, big fields of soybeans, driving the habitat loss that drives biodiversity loss on the land. So, so um, you know, the kind of the, the red, the yellow, the green flavors, the colors, if you will, of uh, salmon, for, of fish farming are red salmon, green, you know, yellow tilapia, green oysters, to choose three examples. Got it. Let's talk a little bit more since you brought up big agriculture. As you said, probably the greatest threat to biodiversity and also a major cause of climate change. Explain a little bit more about how the consumption of fish is a better alternative than eating land animals from a, a conservation standpoint. Obviously, it's not the best thing for the fish themselves, but from a conservation standpoint, you know, we're, there's yeah. fish save land, water, less CO2 costs. You know, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. So um, it is a surprising uh, benefit uh, from rebuilding ocean abundance. So when we rebuild ocean abundance, we not only help the, the ocean be a better, happier place for the creatures that live there, and we help feed the people who, can, who need that marine protein, mm -hmm. we also help with climate change. How do we do that? Well, if people are eating an, a, a fish from an abundant built fishery, they're, they're most likely not eating livestock. You know, so you're either ordering, you know, you're going to McDonald's, you're ordering the fish fillet or you're ordering the hamburger. <laughs> and the hamburger is a driver of climate change because um, livestock emits methane uh, from both ends of the animal. And methane is a very potent driver of climate change. Um, wild caught fish do not. Uh, there's a certain amount of diesel that's built, you know, it's burned you know, by the vessels that go catch wild caught fish. But if you calculate the CO2 methane equivalent per gram of protein, it's way in the favor of uh, fish. And so, so that's a really important benefit that, you know, we ought to be trying to deliver to the future as part of the general effort to save the planet from catastrophic climate change. Rebuilding ocean marine abundance helps with that project. It also helps with um, biodiversity loss on the land, like we just talked about, you know, mm -hmm. 
It also helps with aquifer depletion on the land because in order to irrigate the big the big agriculture field, there's prob there could easily be, it's not true in every case, it could easily be a well that's a well system that's temporary, you know, that's a temporary system that's depleting underwater aquifers non-sustainably. And then lastly, there's a human health benefit because your doctor will tell you that if you convert from red meat to healthy seafood, you're going to reduce your chances of heart disease, your chance of obesity, even some other mood issues and so forth. So five, five levers you get to pull by helping to, you know, produce an abundant ocean, uh, human hunger, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss on the land, aquifer depletion, and human health. All of those move in the right direction. Now, you got to deliver. You know, it can't just be a theory. you got to make sure that you're in a country that is doing a good job on setting quotas, protecting habitat, receiving bycatch, and, and then you will get those benefits. Well, that's a perfect segue into Global Fishing Watch, which I mentioned at the beginning. You created in collaboration with Google and SkyTruth, launched in 2016, which allows you to track in real time the fishing practices of, I believe, over 70,000 commercial fishing vessels all around the world. Tell us about this technology. Yeah, we're very proud of this. Um, Global Fishing Watch, which your viewers should go look at, it's now its, it's, its own uh, platform, its own organization, is doing a fantastic job. What it does is uh, it uses, um, and we launched this, as you said, in uh, 2017 together with a place you may not have heard of called Google, but yeah, and SkyTruth. The, um, it's a new website yeah, called exactly. Google. Yeah, right? exactly. Small <laughs> enterprise out of the web. Google it. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, what we realized in partnership with Google and SkyTruth was that their um, satellite information, um, publicly available satellite information, um, in which tr would, would allow us to monitor in near real time the actions of, as you said, 70,000 plus of the world's largest commercial fishing vessels as they fished. Those vessels carry a transponder that indicates their position to the satellite, sometimes tens of thousands of data points a day, you know, of where, where they are, where they are, where they are. The vessels are... Um, identifiable, uniquely identifiable by their names, by their satellite call sign, I mean, by their radio call signs, by their flag state. And all that information is now mapped globally in near real time by Global Fishing Watch and provided to the world for free. It's one of the greatest things I'm, I'm, I'm really proud that we at Oceana mm -hmm. have ever helped do. So this is a free, re free resource, information resource to everybody in the world. If you can plug into the internet, you can go see it. You can zoom in to any part of the world that you're interested in and look to see who's fishing there. And you can, in fact, so you can see summary level data, like where is the fishing pressure? You can see which vessels, what's the flag states that are fishing? Is this Americans? Is this Spanish? Is this Chinese? Who is it? And then you can even zoom all the way down to a particular vessel that you're interested in. Suppose you suspect a particular vessel of being an illegal operator. You can zoom all the way down and find its vessel track historically. Where has it been back years? Where, where, were the, where was the last port it went to? And, you know, where is it operating right now? So there's all kinds of analysis that this um, platform makes possible for the world. And it's being used now by countries, by academics, by journalists, by fishery managers, by, by people who are wanting to protect their marine protected areas against illegal activities, by people who want to protect their exclusive economic zones. So, for example, um, we have a team in Peru, which is famous for having one of the most productive fisheries in the whole world, the anchovy fishery in Peru. And uh, Peru is right next to Ecuador, and where the Galapagos Islands are. Galapagos, sure, yep. Famous for biodiversity. Darwin found this, you know, Invent, you know, got the data for his little known theory called evolution there. And um, the Chinese have a, have a distant water fleet that is uh, visible on satellite um, right on the edge of the Peruvian exclusive economic zone. They should not be penetrating into the exclusive economic zone of Peru without permission, and they should not be going to Ecuador without permission. And there, you can see on the, on the satellite that they're right up on the edge and uh, in concentration. And, um, you know, this information was highly useful to both the Peruvians and the Ecuadorians to kind of alert their own Navy and their, their own people to, 
pay attention to think about what was happening there to monitor that more closely. So we're very, very proud of this. Another thing that's, and I encourage people to go look at it, globalfishingwatch.org. There's, we can talk a lot about some other things that Global Fishing Watch has been able to do. And I, if you want, I don't want to go too long on it, but we can talk about a few other. No, I like that it. They've made it's definitely, I think it's a fascinating topic. So I, I have definitely more questions about it. It seems like an enormous amount of data to analyze. How the heck are you doing it? Yeah, like, well, do you, we're, you know, we're very, you people right now that are watching and, I mean, how does that work? Well, we're very grateful to Google that makes makes that analysis possible. So Google donates the um, computing power that mm-hmm. is enormous that allows you to process, you know, really millions of data points in 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 near in you know very rapidly, and then to map that data in a way that makes it accessible to real people all over the world. We wouldn't be able to do it if we didn't have Google as a partner. They donate to the they donate that, and we're very grateful to them mm-hmm. for that. Um, they also have engineers that have helped us design the software and, and manage the platforms to make this thing possible. And, um, and we're, you know, we, we believe deeply that, um, you know, as, as one of the um, cliches goes, sun, sunlight is the best disinfectant. <laughs> and so. Um, I thought it was bleach. <laughs> so. So we like the idea that in the future, Increasing numbers of commercial fishing vessels should know that they get to fish on the public resource in exchange for being transparent to the world about what they're doing, when they're doing it. And that that kind of, you know, that kind of, I'm, okay, look at me. I'm an honest fisherman. You can track me. Yeah. Uh, is, is, a, is a necessary part of deterring what we know will always be a certain number of bad guys and gals who want to cheat. Never gonna, we're never going to have a perfect world, but we can make it as difficult as possible for the bad guys and as, and as easy as possible for the honorable fishers, of whom there are many, many, many honorable fishers, and uh, to play by the rules and to show that they're playing by the rules. And if you're cheating, to, to, be, to be more easily caught. You know, I, I feel like I've been saying for the longest time, like, it's accepted that, you know, you don't get to drive around in an automobile without a license plate. And if you if you're if you're driving around a license plate, the police pull you over and say, "What are you doing?" And and we, basically, it should be the same thing. If you're fishing on the public resource without having an effect the license plate, without being mm-hmm. visible, in for what you know while you're doing it, it ought to be it ought to be right away suspicious. You know, like you put yourself in the category of there's something wrong here. Otherwise, you would let us watch you doing it. I think in 10 years, the world will be there. There are, there are important countries that have now stepped forward and added, voluntarily added categories of data to Global Fishing Watch that are called vessel monitoring system data the, um, that gives um, them the ability to track many, many more vessels than they would just relying on this other data system called AIS. And we're seeing increasing numbers of countries come forward with that. It's good for those countries to be able to see their own fleets and what they're doing. It's also good for them to be able to see if other foreign f- vessels are coming in into their EEZ. So I, I love this movement. I think it's I think it's fundamental and I think we're winning. And it does go to a question. I mean, I know you're going to ask me, Rich, because you're, you're good at covering all that people want to hear about. We read a lot about illegal activity at sea. And sometimes it's another area where people can get so discouraged. You know what I mean? Like, is it is it just... Is it just the wild, you know, Sylvia Earle famously said, it's the wild wet, you know, is it just so lawless Mm -hmm. that we can never really realistically hope to have it be abundant and well-managed? The answer is there is lawlessness and it is a problem, but we can get it under control. And in countries where we have, you know, for certainly in countries where we have a Coast Guard and and a Navy like we have in the United States, (laughs) you have, you know, pretty competent government. You see it reasonably well under control. And even in countries that don't have the resources of the United States, you can see success stories. And part of the global success will be transparency. Absolutely. So this leads to a couple questions in my head. One, do these fishermen know that they're being watched? And what's the enforcement process when you see, not that it's you sitting there all day and on the website watching, but when illegal activity is happening, who, you know, who, who's called in? Well, if you are um, 
if you are a fisher and your vessel carries AIS, which is a certain kind of transponder, then you are being, you know, then you are in Global Fishing Watch. And, you know, if you're reasonably, I mean, you haven't, Global Fishing Watch hasn't notified you that you're being, that you're being, but you would know. I mean, this is a big enough deal in the fishing industry. I, I mean, everyone's going to act a little different. If they're if you're driving down the highway, using your example, and you see a cop, you're going to probably you know right. <laughs> change how you drive, especially if you don't have a license plate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In fact, I should tell a story about the Phoenix Island protected area. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, okay. If you're in a country that has decided to put its, its vessel monitoring system data into Global Fishing Watch, then you will then there's a substantially larger number of vessel operators who will now be transparent in their activities and visible in Global Fishing Watch. And I'm sure that the uh, operators, the vessel operators in those countries, know that that decision has been made and are alert to that. So I, I expect that this is like anybody. You know, people know what's happening in their business, and they know and they know that this. They know whether they're on, you know, in there or not. Mm -hmm. um, the what was the other part of your question? The um, do they? Oh, how's it being? Oh, yeah. So they know they're being yeah, watched, right, and right. how is it enforced? If yeah. if they're well, the enforcement badly? the enforcement happens at the national level, right? So um, it you know if you are fishing inside the EEZ of a particular country, which is where most fishing occurs, as we've already discussed. Mm -hmm and you violate the laws, the fishing laws or rules or regulations of that country, then that it's that country that will punish you or yeah. fine you. And yeah. so just like if you're travel, if you're a tourist and you're traveling in another country and you violate the laws of that country, the enforcement is done on you by the police of that country, not by sure. you know, your home country. So these right. countries have to be on your side, quote unquote, your right. side, and they can't be in right. bed with the, the fishermen, obviously. Right. And, and, and there are examples of either side. There are examples of countries that have gotten captured by the fishing interests and are kind of green lighting all kinds of destructive mm -hmm. and illegal activity. And there are countries that have gotten committed to sustainable abundant oceans and are, and are, and are managing it for rebuilding and for abundance yeah, and for everybody sure. making more money and having more fish. So there are both examples. And, and, you know, like any country, it's, it's in the, it's in the country's self-interest not to be corrupt. Uh, it's in the country's long-term public interest, to do the right thing, but um, you have to have leadership that's strong and brave enough and not corrupt and, you know, willing to take the long view. Got it. And then the other thing that came to me, you mentioned there, you're monitoring 70,000 boats, um, fishing vessels, and I think there's something like you would know better. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of fishing vessels out in the ocean right now. 70,000 seems like a small number. Is it because those are the ones, is it just the numbers game? They're catching the highest percentage of fish, obviously? Well, yes, your guess is your guess is correct, Rich. So um, the vessels that are covered in Global Fishing Watch are the largest vessels in the world because they're the ones mandated under international law to carry this transponder called AIS. So the good news is that the boats that you would most want to be trackable are trackable under Global Vision Watch. Now, also, what I said is true. I think everybody should be trackable all the way down. You know, if you're a commercial fisherman, no matter, you know, all the way down to some relatively small boat, I think a, a well-managed world would mandate that everywhere. And and that that's where I'm trying to get, that's why we're trying to press the world to go. And uh, we support that. Um, the, the um, and we're making progress on that. As I said, the VMS, Adoption is, is is expanding the number of data of vessels that are in Global Fishing Watch over time, and there will be more and more of that. But that requires a series of country level decisions. the um, The limit is not really technical. The limit is just uh, mandating mandating that you carry a transponder, and then mandating that the data from that transponder be made public to Global Fishing Watch. Those are the those are their limits. Um, we don't. Right. We we're not arbitrarily limiting <laughs> to seventy thousand. Yeah. We would take more the better as the goal of Global Fishing sure. Watch. I serve on the board of Global Fishing Watch, so we want we want more, and we're supporting more. And I think, that, and not just I think, I know the world is moving in that direction. Beautiful. Yeah, it seems like there's so many uses for this program. You mentioned a few already, uh, but let's go a little deeper. How, how can governments use this? 
uh, seafood suppliers to make sure their providers are acting under the law. You mentioned news organizations. Also, and you anyone can just go on and, and watch general population, concerned citizens. What, what else do you want to share about the uses for the program? Yeah, I mean, I encourage people to go to look at Global Fishing Watch. There, there are um, very interesting case examples there uh, of how the how the tool has been used in all the ways you just described, Rich, and others. Let me give a couple of illustrations. There's a place called the Phoenix Island Protected Area in the Pacific that um, is under the control of the country Kiribati, and uh, it's a wonderful piece of the ocean from a biological perspective. Kiribati announced that they would create a big protected area called the Phoenix Island Protected Area a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, there was some question in the world about whether that was just a PR stunt by the Kiribati or whether they were serious about enforcing it. And um, it's a relatively uh, resource-limited country. It doesn't have a big navy. And so, you know, you could ask questions about were they really serious or were they just trying to look good, you know, in some conservation audience? Sure, sure. So after they made their announcement, um, the president of Kiribati said, gave a date and he said on, you know, January 1st, I think it was 2016. I'm trying to remember the year. I've forgotten. You know, I, I will. I, you will be in trouble if you're fishing inside the, the protected area because we and so we did an analysis on Global Fishing Watch, which you can see that compared the before and the after. And it's incredibly reassuring because what you see is as, as the date approaches, there's a, about 200 vessels fishing inside the protected area. They leave, it doesn't happen. Mm. And so by the date, by the date of enforcement, they're all gone. <laughs> mm. and, and it's really, a, it's a really a, a protected area. Um, so it's a very reassuring success story and uh, proof that these sorts of things can work even in, in countries that don't have huge resources. There then was a later event where there was a vessel was discovered by Global Fishing Watch to have entered the protected area and to have fished. We gave we gave that information to the Kiribati government. They confronted the vessel. They showed them the Global Fishing Watch histories, and they got a fine from that vessel, a substantial fine. It was like one or two percent of the whole GNP of the country. I mean, so there's there's success stories. Another success story, big academic report uh, last summer about um, fishing off the coast of North Korea. So there, there was discovered, academics used Global Fishing Watch to do an analysis that showed that there were hundreds of Chinese boats fishing off the coast of North Korea with their transponders turned off. How was that identifiable? Well, they could use other kinds of satellite data that's infrared and, and, and see that there were boats fishing right where there were no transponder data. And so it was apparent to these authors of this article, and again, I encourage people to go read the story, mm -hmm. that there was an intentional activity by the Chinese fleet, probably in violation of the UN sanctions against North Korea, which forbid, because of the nuclear issue, anybody from this, you know, paying the North Koreans kind of for this kind of right, uh, that they were fishing pretty aggressively for squid off the, off the coast of North Korea and hiding that activity from the world. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I like this. There are particular examples of known illegal fish. So there's a certain, there's a short list of vessels that are famous as illegal fishers or famous in some cases for having slavery on board and using um, forced labor. That's right. and, you know, when those vessels come in and out of port, sometimes, you know, Global Fishing Watch is able to help notify countries that, you know, this is somebody you ought to be paying close attention to. Um, and then there are, um, there's some other couple examples of application of it that, I, that I'm very proud of. So one of them is called Ship Speed Watch. And this is, takes us into a different area, Rich, but it's, it shows you using satellite information for doing good with the ocean. So there's a Creature called the North Atlantic right whale that used to read my mind. I was going to, this is my next question because I, I read about how you're using Global Fishing Watch to protect whales, which, as you know, are a huge passion of mine. So that was my next question. Let's hear it. Well, I know you know a lot about whales, and I should invite you to, to talk about these, these creatures, Bridge, but I will tell you what I know. So, North Atlantic right whales used to, used to be very abundant in the world's oceans. In, 
we don't even know how many of them there used to be pre um, pre the era the whaling era you know in the 1800s but certainly tens and tens of thousands of them and they live on the east coast of the United States and Canada and their life cycle like all whales has them swim north and south each year south to give birth around the equator warm waters and then north to feed up in the colder more abundant waters of Canada Mm -hmm. And um, sadly, there are less than 400 of individuals now, of these whales, left in the world. So we and many other organizations are in a desperate fight to rebuild these creatures, protect them from extinction. This is, this is a real threat that they will be gone forever in the next 20 years unless we change the trajectory. What are the threats that hurt these whales now? I mean, obviously, commercial whaling ended a long time ago. So what are the threats that are killing them now? Well, there are two chief threats. One of them is being struck by ships. These whales like to feed on the surface and swim on the surface. It's part of the reason they were called the right whale, is that they were easy to spot. The whalers could spot them easily in the age of sailing, whaling, sailing, whaling, whalers who were on sailors, sailboats. And, but as a result, if you're uh, a, sl a relatively slow swimming whale and a fast boat comes along and hits you, you it can kill you or damage you so badly that you don't survive with your you know, a propeller injury. The other danger for them is uh, entanglement in fishing gear. The lines that go from the surface buoys down to pots, for example, lobster pots off the coast of New England, can sometimes entangle the whales as they swim along. And since they breathe air like you and I do, if you're weighted down by a lobster pot, you eventually can get so tired that you can't get to the surface and breathe and then you drown. So right. we and, ev and many other organizations are fighting to help them have fewer of those threats. And working with Global Fishing Watch, we and others launched, I mean, in partnership, launched a tracking tool for whether ships traversing um, the zones where the whales are migrating are observing basically speed limits. And uh, Canadians in particular have done a good job of imposing speed limits in areas where the right whales are known to be present to, to, to give the whales a chance to get out of the way of the boats that might otherwise hit them and kill them. And um, Ship Speed Watch uses the same satellite information we were talking about in Global Fishing Watch to monitor speed limits, speed, I mean, mm -hmm. speed, ship speeds in the, in the, in the limited zones. And it's discovered that uh, in the voluntary zone, so the Canadians created a mandatory zone and a voluntary zone. And what we, our Canadian team has told the Canadians with a lot of data is that the voluntary thing is not working. <laughs> mm. And that the, uh, sadly, the ship operators in the zone where they are encouraged but not required to slow down are not. And as a result, the whales there are in, in, in okay. considerable peril. Mm. Well, anything that you can do to protect whales is is going to make me happy. Um, anything else you want to share about Global Fishing Watch overall goal, vision, impact you want to make in the next? I mean, you're about five years old now. In the next five years or so. Well, I mean, I I just think want people to go to the website, go see the tool. I think I think you want to um, you want to learn a couple things from it when you go to it. You want to learn, first of all, the optimism that just like having a real-time global view of the world's fishing fleet will bring you. Secondly, you want to look at the distant water fleets. And there are about 12 distant water fleets that are fishing all over the world. There, are, We need to get them under control. They go up against the, right up against the coasts of poorer countries, and you can see them in action. And then thirdly, um, you know, you should be supporting the general requirement that I talked about that um, it ought to be the case that if you're a commercial fisherman fishing on the public resource, you need to agree as part of that to be trackable in real time yeah. and visible to the public. That's part of just being a good fishing citizen. It feels to me like it's, it's kind of a two prong approach on, on one side. We want to um, create more love and compassion and awareness for the ocean so that people make better decisions when it comes to protecting it. And at the same time, we got to have laws and policies in place because like you said, we don't live in a perfect world and there's always going to want to be people doing the wrong thing. So it sounds like a, a good approach from that standpoint. 
Um, can I curious one about, other thing? Just one of the yeah, things, you, know, you know, I can go on and on. One of the interesting <laughs> reports that we did and the Cold Fishing Watch has done is to study transshipment at sea. So mm -hmm. there are about 200 big vessels that are that, that basically serve as kind of at sea processing vessels. And these vessels, which are big and have uh, long periods of time at sea, um, are are a tr are troublesome in terms of trying to deliver sustainable management to the world's oceans because they allow for cheating. They allow for a, a vessel to fish inside an EEZ, fill up its hold with vessel with fish, and then go out into the high seas, transfer those fish at sea to the processor, mm. and then go back into the you know country's EEZ and act like they didn't catch all the fish that they really caught. There also are um, forced labor practices that often correlate with, with, you know, the ability to stay at sea for very long periods of time, which, of course, is facilitated by these 200 or so big refrigerated at sea processors. So Global Fishing Watch has issued reports and allows you to see when there are transshipment events, right? So it allows you to see when a vessel is, is transferring fish and then you can see the name of that vessel and what port it comes back to. And so if you're a country, you can, you ought to be more closely managing the, the boats that you can see going back and forth to a transshipper at sea. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a, it's a way to guide your enforcement resources to more results. You can also use, you know, Global Fishing Watch to target, you know, like the Americans are using Global Fishing Watch to target their Coast Guard. So the coast, the American Coast Guard does inspections at sea of international vessels that are fishing in the Pacific under treaties that we're a party to. And the American Coast Guard is very grateful to Global Fishing Watch for helping it identify where to put its its enforcement resources so they'll make a bigger difference. You You mentioned the UN a few minutes ago. Do you think they're doing enough to deal with all these these challenging issues? No, I don't. I think the United Nations needs to do a lot more, especially in high seas management. And I mean the, the the committees that run the high seas, which are a UN thing, are very weak, and they don't do enough on quotas and on habitat and on bycatch reduction. And the reason they don't do that is that they operate under a kind of consensus process where any single country can raise its hand and stop everybody else from agreeing to a sensible policy. And and that's just a broken system, in my opinion. I mean, we all of us have been in meetings where, you know, the group, the general group is wise and is willing to do the right and difficult thing. And there's somebody who just says, no, 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 no. And right. you have to have in a real one world the, the ability for the majority to insist on what's good for the future and good for the for the most people. And unfortunately, the United Nations high seas processes are subject to this lost common denominator outcome over and over again. That's I, I, I think they need to fix that and they need to do a better job. I also think that um, international trade and endangered species, which is also managed by the United Nations, there's a something called CITES, there's a treaty called CITES, which is kind of like the United Nations process. That also should do a lot more for marine protection. We started talking out about the threats to sharks from international trade in fins. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen much more action under CITES for terrestrial creatures than we have for marine creatures. There needs to be more there. So, I mean, the UN, you know, has has a lot of difficult problems that it has to manage, um, but it needs to do much better on the oceans. Got it. I'm glad I asked that. So I want to look at... Um... What does Oceana feel are the most pressing issues here in the United States? Um, a few years ago, I emceed a rally right here in Laguna Beach where we were protesting against offshore drilling off the coast of Southern California. Uh, Ted Danson, who sits on your board of directors, came and spoke. And I know Ted started campaigning for ocean protection back in the 80s, and I believe his work played a role in the creation of Oceana back in 2001. What can you tell me about Ted and also about current efforts uh, to ban offshore drilling? Well, there's, those are two happy subjects. Uh, <laughs> Ted Danson and offshore oil drilling in the United States, uh, both of them have been, um, you know, Ted was an early, uh, early, early opponent of offshore drilling. Uh, going, I think back to well before I knew him, 
you know, in the 1970s. Uh, wow. He was one of the earliest people to st stand up and use his very considerable celebrity to call attention to the fact that ocean offshore oil drilling was a big threat to things that people love, their fisheries, their beaches, their whales, their coastal summer vacation mm -hmm. towns, the fishery towns that, you know, on our edge, you know, that are on our coasts. And, um, you know, it's a 50 year battle when you look at it over that period of time. And I'm happy to say that President Biden is the very first president to announce that he intended to place a uh, moratorium, which we hope will become permanent. It's currently, you know, it's, it's currently temporary, but he, we, we believe he will make it permanent on expanded offshore oil and gas drilling in United States waters. Um, that is within our reach here in the United States under the leadership of President Biden and with support from many conservationists and good policymakers. Um, and that's a necessary outcome if you care about wonderful beaches and beach towns and their communities. And we've organized countless uh, local coastal business people to speak up, you know, successfully uh, in support of no more offshore oil, oil drilling. And um, in fact, there was a period of time when 13 out of 14 coastal governors supported offshore drilling, partly because they were going to get tax revenue from that. And now they do not. And now the federal government is getting behind, has, you know, has put a pause on any new offshore oil leases, and, and I hope we'll make that permanent. I give Ted a lot of credit for that. He, he was an early battler on this, starting in the 70s. He, in 2008, in 2010, uh, two years before Gulf Water, Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico, Ted Danson and Philippe Cousteau went to Congress to testify before a uh, House committee on the question of offshore oil drilling. At that point, President Obama was supporting offshore oil drilling under his all the above policy. Interesting. Um, very brave uh, of Ted and Philippe to do this. They were testified for three and a half hours and uh, made the case before a not always friendly congressional committee that you know had friends and, and enemies on this topic. Um, about the necessity for, for restricting expand and then Deepwater Horizon happened <laughs> two, two years later. So I I give Ted Ted is a really important ocean conservationist who who has used year after year after year very generously his celebrity to call attention to the cause, to show up not just as you know at the beautiful parties, but to go to Capitol mm -hmm. Hill and speak to politicians and policymakers to help raise the money that, you know, that we need to pay our scientists and our lawyers and our advocates and our organizers. He's a board member of Oceana, as you said, from the founding days of Oceana and is a wise voice. He's a very modest person, but I have seen him on the board over and over again, sit quietly, listen to everybody talk about some difficult decision and then be the person that people turn to. <laughs> Okay, so what do we really think here? And he'll be very often the person who can, because he's such a good listener and he's so thoughtful and he's so smart, you know, like say, well, I think here's what we, seems to me the group thinks. And he's, he's a very, very, very wonderful guy, helpful leader, important. Yeah, when, <clears throat> when I got to meet him a few years ago, he was so kind. Like he was just very, you never know when you're going to meet a celebrity, but he was just super humble and happy to be there and everybody just loved him. It was, it was great. That's cool. Thanks for uh, for sharing that story. A um, couple more questions on your website. Overfishing is the number one issue, and then number two is pollution. And it says that mercury, antibiotics, oil, and climate changing gases threaten marine life habitat and, of course, human health. What is Oceana doing in regards to ocean pollution? Yeah, well, the one that I'd want to talk about is not in that list that, that you just mentioned, and maybe that's a mistake on our website. But that would be plastic ocean plastic pollution. Yeah. Uh, we have in the last year or so begun camp joined the many groups that are campaigning to stop ocean plastic pollution. And uh, one of the mistakes, by the way, in the film was that the film represents that uh, ghost fishing gear is, is a major driver of ocean plastic. That's not true. It's about, you know, the responsible sub studies show it's about 20% of all ocean plastic. The vast majority of ocean plastic comes from, as you would think, 
from throwaway single-use plastics, plastic bottles, other sorts of plastic packaging. So the really important battle, really important battle for ocean health now, in addition to overfishing, is to by passing is is it's the job to pass laws to restrict companies from choosing this material, plastic, that lasts essentially forever for for a purpose that's like a one-time use. I mean, this is, from a systems point of view, this is very dangerous, right? Why would you allow companies to do this? Um, plastic, when it breaks down, doesn't convert back into naturally useful materials. It just remains plastic and becomes smaller and smaller versions of particles of plastic. And in small particles in the ocean, it gets consumed by creatures that can't tell the difference between plastic and other microorganisms. And so it's very dangerous for ocean health and for the long-term health of the ocean. So there's a big battle right now over how to frame the problem. And the companies, the plastic polluting companies, want the problem to be framed as a failure of recycling. Um, and we want it to be framed as a upstream choice by the company to become a polluter, that they have chosen to use a, a permanent material for a one-time purpose, and that's what a polluter does. And we ought to call them out, name them for what they are, which is being polluters. Only nine, the reason that we're not willing to bet on recycling is that we're science-driven organization, and we go to the facts, and the facts are that of all the plastic that's ever been produced, only 9% has ever been recycled. The rest of it ends up in landfills, ends up being incinerated, ends up polluting the world. This is the fact. <laughs> so it's not possible to believe, if you're a reasonable person, that you're going to be able to fix that, that horrible problem by fixing recycling, especially given the rate at which plastic packaging is growing in the world, which is exponential. So mm -hmm. we are fighting for, together with many allies, national legislation in all the 10 countries where we operate that will mandate reductions in single-use plastic. And one of our most important goals is to get Amazon, you'll have heard of them, Rich, um, to offer people a plastic-free choice at checkout. We think it's the duty of this very important, important leadership company to give all of its customers at checkout a choice to get, get their package delivered without all those plastic pillows, with all that, without that plastic bag that's the wrapper sometimes for the delivery. And um, you shouldn't have to be an ocean polluter to buy from Amazon. You should give people a choice. So we're, we've been calling on Amazon to do that. Um, and I hope that your listeners and We'll, have, we'll consider coming to our website and joining that campaign. So I 100% agree with what you're saying about uh, recycling. It's it's clearly an antiquated system. I'm curious when you mentioned Amazon and other major polluters, as you're calling them correctly, how are they responding? Are, are, are they Do they get it? Are they listening? Do they care? Well, not so far. Um, sorry to say, Amazon, we've, we've had some meetings with Amazon and asked them to their senior executives to ask them to commit to this, what seems like a very reasonable choice, give people a choice, give them the freedom to choose to not be a polluter. And they have not been willing to make that commitment. Uh, they talk about recycling. Would it actually, wouldn't it save them money? Like they're about well, putting all the, they're buying all this plastic that comes in, like you get a, you buy something and it's in a plastic bag and that's in a plastic bag. And then like, it, which is completely useless. I don't know. Why would they resist? Well, I, I, I expect that there's, they would like the solution to be recycling because then it's not their problem. You know, um, I also think that, um, I mean, it's a little, it is troubling to me. I mean, this is a company with huge opportunity to lead. It has all the resources in the world. It's made a huge amount yeah. of money during, during the pandemic. It has, it's led by an engineering CEO who's interested in redesign of systems. He's proven he can do that. It has top to bottom system level control. So it can it can design it more than anybody else. It could it could say to its suppliers, "You're going to give me alternatives that aren't plastic free." I mean, it has the leverage, it has the engineering skill, it has the resources. 
to fix this and it could easily do it and it could show the world a, a better future. So I'm, mm -hmm. I want them to do that and I'm disappointed that they haven't so far stepped up to it. I can't read the executives' minds. I'm not in the meetings in Seattle where they have these discussions, but I, I, I think they ought to. There was an interesting event. The annual shareholder meeting of Amazon was held um, two weeks ago, I think. Um, and uh, one of the shareholder resolutions was on this topic. And it was asked for Amazon to to publish its footprint, its plastic footprint. So it didn't it didn't ask for them to take the position we're seeking, which is to offer people a plastic free choice to check up. But it was a good thing, you know, like tell us at least what the foot plastic footprint of, of Amazon is. And and the management of Amazon took the position that they wanted that resolution, that shareholder resolution defeated. So that was a moment for the management of Amazon to show its colors. Was it willing to at least be transparent, so to speak, about its use of this pollutant. And it said, no, it did not want to do that. And, and um, now, despite that, uh, I mean, the shareholder resolution was defeated, but it got more votes from shareholders than any but any other, except one other resolution. I think there were 15 resolutions, and it was the second most successful shareholder resolution, although it was defeated. I mean, usually when management opposes something, shareholder res resolutions are defeated. Um right. So this was defeated, but it was defeated in a way that it kind of encouraged the good guys because the numbers, the shareholder numbers are better than we thought. I remember seeing the report last year. Don't quote me on the number, but I, I think it was in 2019. They used like 473-ish million pounds of plastic. That was in 2019. I can only imagine that number must have at least went up three to four times in 2020. Um, so I, I guess I wonder like, is this, like we were saying before, is this a, a policy issue, kind of a top-down where laws need to be put in place, where we're just these single-use plastics become illegal? Or is it a bottom-up where us as the public just says, we're not buying your plastic anymore, we don't want it? Or is it, a, is it both? Like what, ultimately, I feel like it's like electric cars. In 50 years, I would imagine 95 nine percent of the cars on the road if not all of them will be electric i sure hope in 50 years it's the same thing with single-use plastics what's, what's the solution yeah well i think i think that the we are going to need national laws we're not only going to do it through voluntary action so there is a bill in congress called the break free from plastic act i think mm -hmm. i've got its name correct that's right. That's right. There's a bill in congress we hoped we're, we're fighting along with a big coalition to get that passed i think there's you know Again, I invite people to help talk to their congressman, talk to their senator about your desire for this. That would—it's a good bill. It would—it would start the trajectory downwards instead of endlessly upwards. We need to do that, and other countries need to do that. In the meantime, leading countries and I mean leading companies matter both in terms of their own responsibility, but also in terms of what they signal to the policymakers. So, you know, a big brand like Amazon that's using lots of throwaway plastic packaging is either signaling to the policymakers that, you know, they should do the right thing or the wrong thing. I mean, policy, swing, you know, policymakers in the middle watch to see what important companies do and they can take encouragement in good direction or bad direction. Um, so we we would like consumers to of Amazon and who isn't, you know, to let Amazon know that they're going to do that and then that they want them to do that. And then if Amazon would do that, I think that would create some space on Capitol Hill for more more politicians to get behind the uh, the law. Okay. So it's top down and, and, and bottom, bottom up. up. Yeah, there's a way that's the way democracies yep. kind of get things done. And also but the other thing's happening on this is that there are lots of towns and counties and cities and states that are starting to take action to restrict single-use plastic packaging. And I want to, you know, people should hear. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about all plastic. We're talking about plastic packaging, which is the most wasteful category and the dominant category that gets thrown away. And there are um, now hundreds of, of good success stories of ordinances at the local level that are, you know, phasing out styrofoam, phasing out yep. categories of single-use plastic. And, you know, New York State has taken action. You know, California is considering some interesting laws. Um, That's right. And Washington State recently passed an important law. And I mean, there's more than I can, you know, people, again, can go look and see lots and lots of local actions. 
Yeah, in fact, small scale win. Um, in I got to play a, a nice little role along with uh, leaders at Surfrider and your organization. Just what was it? Just less than a month ago, where where I live here in Laguna Beach, California, uh, it was a, a pretty aggressive ban on uh, plastic related to foodware. In fact, we're going back to city council tonight just to make sure there's another little yep. resolution about it. So. Yeah, things are happening. It just needs, in my mind, it's, we're we're in this all hands on deck moment, and we don't really have the luxury of time, and so things uh, should need to happen quicker rather than slower. Final topic: uh, a few years ago, as you remember, I had the opportunity to take you and many other Oceana leaders whale watching here off the coast of Southern California. And for me, this quest to learn solutions to the challenges the ocean is facing is mainly driven by my love for the whales and the dolphins, more so than the humans, quite honestly. I love the humans also, but it's it's always been about the whales and dolphins. So seismic air gun blasting, a dangerous process used to search for oil and gas, creates one of the loudest man-made sounds in the ocean and injures and even kills everything from zooplankton to large whales. How big of an issue is this, and uh, what is Oceana doing to fight against this? Um, you described it well. Anywhere that anywhere that you have a government that is allowing oil companies to explore offshore for the, for offshore oil and gas deposits, you have a dan a dangerous thing happening called seismic uh, testing, in which very loud sounds are are produced underwater to create an an under a map of the seafloor and the under the rock formations under the seafloor, and and because uh, whales and dolphins hunt for their prey by echolocating and using their hearing, this is dreadfully damaging to those creatures. It chases them away from their feeding grounds because they can't hear. In some cases, it could damage their own their ability to hear permanently. It's it's a horrible thing. So. If you if you didn't care about ocean oil drilling because of what it might do to your own beach, you could care about it because of what it's going to do to the whales and dolphins. So it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Everywhere they're allowing for offshore oil exploration, this is happening, and uh, it's just it's what they do. It's what the industry does to come in and try to figure out where to drill. The very good news in the United States is that because there is no, you know, leasing under the Biden administration policy, there's no seismic exploration. No need, no need to do it. Yeah, and they're not allowed to do it. Now, seismic testing in American waters requires a permit, and we always, we and other groups always carefully watch and fight those seismic permits because we worry about what it's going to do and, you know, force the industry to, to really prove that it's necessary and, you know, try to stop them in every way we can. But it is, uh, so we're now asking in Oceana whether there are some, opportunities in other countries outside the United States to oppose offshore oil drilling in other countries inside those EEZs. We talked about the exclusive economic zones in other countries where we have advocacy teams. It's the same thing we started talking about, Rich, is that the Americans have led on offshore oil and we, the way we want them to lead on sharks. And so now that we've just about won a victory in the United States on limiting off, new offshore oil and gas drilling, we want to ask ourselves, now that we've done that, we want to ask ourselves, well, what other countries could also be influenced by the Americans and decide to do the same thing? Very good. Well, that kind of brings us full circle back to shark finning. Andy, you've been uh, CEO of Oceana since 2013, almost long as long as the organization has been. Rich. 2000, what did I say? 2013, 2003, just seeing if you're paying attention. Uh, my last question is, Two, two questions. How much longer do you anticipate holding the reins? And um, what drives you to keep fighting for these causes that you believe in every single day? Well, I, I like I like my job a lot. I'm very proud of Oceana. I'm proud of what we do. And, um, you know, even on my bad days, I enjoy going to work. So um, I don't I don't know. I don't know when I want to stop. I mean, I'm 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 old enough to start thinking about succession, but I haven't really got a plan, Rich. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm so proud of what we do and I enjoy it. Uh, the day will come, but I don't know when it is. Um, nice. And then the, on the, on the uh, second part of your question, um, the thing that keeps me going is, is delivering outcomes, is delivering policy change. I mean, at the end of the day, 
it's not the process that matters, it's the outcomes. Are we, are we, are we fixing ocean, fixing the ocean or not? Are we rebuilding fisheries or not? Are we reducing illegality or not? Are we getting the policies in place or not? Not are we trying? Not did we have a nice meeting? Not did we have a nice television, you know, video, social media event? But did we get the policy changed? And, you know, we have 200 plus policy outcomes that are substantial building blocks, each one of them in restoring ocean abundance. And that's what keeps me going. It's just to keep, keep building that every, every single victory is another brick in, in, in the building. And uh, we have a lot of building still to do, but it's just knowing that we're actually having it. I mean, I'm so proud of us. And a lot of NGOs celebrate trying <laughs> and I don't, I don't really get too motivated by trying and failing. I get, I get motivated by actually getting to a win, a win defined as an outcome. And, we have enough of them. We don't have all the ones we would like, and we get defeated sometimes. But we have enough outcomes to keep me motivated. Nice. You sound like me talking to my team. It's like it's it's about results. Like we need results, and it's finding that balance of self. And I think you're kind of doing this. You said this at the beginning, celebrating when good things happen, and at the same time. You just keep moving forward and, and, and keep plugging ahead. So, Andy, we will share links to everything that you shared. There was a lot there. Uh, so we'll make sure that everybody can check out everything that you talked about. And um, what's the best way for people to support Oceana? Well, please come to our website and there's a you can join, sign up for our, you know, our contact list that we call pe- such people who do that, Wave Makers. And of course, we have very, very active Instagram, Facebook, email you know, all the, all the social media platforms, Twitter, you know, you can sign up to be on any of those lists and and be regularly in contact with us. Hope you'll do that. Nice. We will share all that. This has been a very enlightening conversation, Andy. I appreciate, um, not only just your passion. Um, I, I felt like I threw a couple legit, but not the easiest questions at the, you know, at you and, and the way you handle that was great. I I appreciate you. I appreciate the work that you do. And I look forward to the next time we can get out on that boat together and go uh, check out some more. That was a great day, Rich. That was a great day. Thank Thank you you so much. All right. All right, everybody. That's our show for today. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much.